But here's some statistics. Indonesia has 260 million people. I just want you to get your mind around that for a moment. South Africa, where are we at? 60, 50, 60? 260 million people. Now, I'm going to show you a few photos of our trip, and I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing as I, as I go through it and who the people are with me. This is, this is where we went. So they based on Bali. The reason they based on Bali is not the reasons you think. It's not for the snorkeling. They based there because it's the most open spiritually. It's, it's a Hindu island. It's very um, nominal. So a lot of the missionaries are based there and they work out of Bali. Francois and Raleen believe that, God's, that God has called them into Indonesia not to plant a church. It's to equip locals. So that's their mandate. They learn the language and they go and they work and they make disciples among the Indonesian people and they try and mobilize them to go into other Indonesian areas and to effect change for the gospel in those areas. And I think it's a powerful strategy. We went across to the island of Sambawa. You can see it's actually huge. It's bigger than Bali with a much smaller population. Um, and we went, if you said, go to the next slide for me. That's the city we went to right on the far right, the city of Bima. There's a whole lot of fascinating things I could tell you about this, but for the sake of time, I won't at the moment. But what's, this whole island is entirely Muslim. In the time we were there, I said last week I didn't meet one person who knew the name of Jesus. I thought about it and I had to, there was one person that we met who was our taxi driver out of the whole, everyone we spoke to in four days, one person had even heard of Jesus. It's unbelievable. It's literally like the book of Acts where, where Paul or one of the guys are going and they're saying, hey, have you heard about Jesus? And they're like, well, who's this Jesus? And you begin to tell a story about a man who came and a man who died 2,000 years ago, but it's not, we don't hear it with our Western ears, which are so used to the story of the gospel and so blasé. It's the first time they're hearing it. It's incredible. Go to the next one for me, if you would. Thanks, Dev. So that's who I was with. There were four of us that were on the, on the far left. There's a guy called Ron, an absolute champion. He led a church in Texas, Austin, for 20 years. Um, he's been in Indonesia with his family for 16 years. They've been plowing in there. He speaks the language fluently, um, an unbelievable witness for the gospel, and he's a mentor to Francois. So Francois is in the middle, and then Steph, who leads our Somerset West Church, is on the right, and I'm taking the picture. Can you go to the next one for me? This is what we did day after day, is literally going around, finding places, sitting down, seeing people who are prepared to talk, Guys, we were hiring motorcycles from every kind of opportunity we had. We'd sit down, eat that. What, we, what we're eating there is the most disgusting food you can imagine. It's like black rice with ginger and about 500 teaspoons of sugar. They really like their, I'm kidding, I mean, it's not 500 teaspoons, but it's, and they love their sugar. So everything is like so sweet. And that's Ron just sharing the gospel. He went on Bema for the first time 12 years ago, and he had a month there. And he led five people in that time to the Lord. And so we were really looking hard to try and find these five guys to see, because he has, at that stage, he had no internet there. They had no ability to comms. There were no cell phones. So it's very rural. So we didn't find any of them, but this was just trying to find one of them. We found this guy, and we're sharing the gospel. Skip to the next one for me, if you would. Ron again sharing the gospel with a bunch of guys that we hired our motorbikes from. Next one. And then this is what we did in our, in our, ev in our evenings. That's Ibrahim. And what we were trying to do is, is the strategy that they employ is they look for what, what Luke 10 calls a man of peace. So they go into a new area. People have no idea who Jesus is. And they look for someone that will open their home that looks like they're interested in the gospel, that's not um, against it or extreme in any way. And um, that person will be the person that they then begin to work with. Over the years, they'll begin to disciple him. And hopefully that group begins to grow and they disciple more people. So we just went back to the same guy every night buying his little food stuff and drinking their juice. It's amazing. They've got these fruit is like everywhere, just tons and tons of fruit. And it's like, we, we paid 125 rand for four adult males for the, for the entire meal. That's everything included. Not each, all of us. So we'd go back and just talk with him night after night about the gospel. Go to the next one for us. This is now, he's now the, on night three, he brought his wife, a friend, and another wife. So now you can see how it begins to grow. And you're sitting and you're talking to four people and that's as far as we got. We didn't have open air church service. <laughs> if you go to the next one for me. 
Devin, play that, will you play that video? Thank you. This is just looking from the top of our, you can call it a hotel, it's not really, it didn't even have hot water. Um, looking out over the city of Bima, and you'll just get a, a sound as they are praying at sunset. Hey Ron, just tell us what's going on here. So it's Magri, which is sunset in the, it's a call to prayer that we're hearing from all the mosques around the city. And uh, most of these are people that are doing what's called the Adstin, where they're calling out, calling us to pray, and so we are praying. We're answering that call, praying that they'd know Jesus. Can they call and we stand up on the roof and at night and we begin to pray and cry out that God would bring change in those areas. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Dave, if, Dave, if you go, I think we've got one or two more pictures. Um, this is a group. So Ron and Francois coordinated with an, with an American church called Antioch. They're doing some cool stuff. They sent 1,300 young men and women over for three months um, in varying teams over now, so it was May, June, July. So when we got there, they just had these 1,300. But the real fruit that they're seeing is that for that group, they had 300 interpreters. And they have committed to following up on, there was about, there was about I think they shared the gospel with 15,000 people over that period. And they had about 1,000 people who said yes to the gospel. Obviously, there'll be good and bad fruit in there. But they've immediately started what they call discovery Bible groups, is where they sit and they begin to discuss and, and understand the Bible and how do they obey the Bible. And these 300 translators are the, the core of those who are going to be doing the discipleship groups with them. I want you to note, young men, how many women are in that photo and how the women are stepping up to the plate. And where are our men? You young oaks. We're going to send some of you. But this majority woman, this is one of the groups, and they're doing multiple trainings like this of the, of the translators. Um, the Christians across the whole nation of Indonesia are about officially at about 9 or 10%. Um, but it's incredibly animalistic by, by religion. So that means that some of them proclaim to be Muslim, some of them proclaim to be Hindu, some of them proclaim Christianity, but underneath it is a very uh, underlying ancestral worship is effectively what rules the nation of Indonesia. Demonic manifestations are common. They're not just not unusual at all to see people oppressed with demonic stuff, to see crazy illnesses and, and a lot of deformity and things like that um, going on. And Ron said this, and this is where I want to end this section of what we're talking about this morning. He said that he's done an audit, and in Austin, Texas, where he's from, there are more Christian workers in that one city in America than in the entire Indonesia. Then he said, Paul, he said, there's something wrong. He said, there's something wrong. He says, we are sending our resources and we are sending our people to the places that are already heard. They've already heard the gospel. They've already got teachers. They've already got people telling them about Jesus. And those places where there's 260 million people, where the bulk of them have never even heard the name of Jesus, we're too afraid to go. We don't want a resource. We don't want to send people there. And that just, man, that challenged me. So I, I've been praying since I've been there and as I come back, and I think we should start praying it into the future. Imagine if God sends from us here some long-termers. Do you know what that term means? So we need people who, the missions are, are difficult. Going in there, I, I was extremely ineffective because I can't speak any of the languages. We need people who are going to go there and are going to commit to spending a year learning the language and then another few years to actually discipling Indonesians that are able to then disciple Indonesians. That's what we need to happen. And so I'm going to put my faith out and I'll do it publicly and say, God, would you send some of us as long-termers, would you send men and women from this congregation, like you've sent Francois and Raline, to go and join in the work that's happening? And maybe even this morning, God would stir something in your heart and maybe the next trip you can go with me and go and see what's going on in that place. It's amazing, eh? Great. So that was the trip to Indonesia. I could tell you so many more stories, but I'll stop there because I want to speak from Philippians. Turn with me to chapter 3 again. We're going to be looking at verse 17 to 21 this morning. Right, let's join and read together 
Let's do it a little bit differently this morning. Won't you read with me? So let's stand, let's stand to our feet and just get some blood flowing through our veins after a bit of a testimony about Indo. And let's read from verse 17 together. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Thank you. You guys are so compliant. You can sit down. This morning I'm going to be speaking about living examples, and I think it's such a a pertinent place to reach in Philippians as I've been talking to you about Francois and Raleen and their kids, and an incredible living example that we've got out of New Gen that's living in this place in Indonesia. And I know that's a temptation to hold up the missionaries as kind of like, ooh, over there, but right here in our midst this morning we've got another whole 18, did you say, 18 living examples going out next weekend. I must mention that Charmaine is not here this morning, but she's going on that team. So for those of you who are older, and by that I mean over 30 in this context, Charmaine's going on that team, which is, I just think that's cool. So I just wanted to share that. But we've got living examples among us, and that's what we're going to speak about this morning. So let's ask this quick question. What is Paul saying? What is he teaching? What is he trying to encourage the Philippian church in this verse? Two weeks ago, Bates, if you were here, spoke brilliantly around fixing your eyes on Jesus. For those of you who are here, fixing your eyes on Jesus. Well, this is a continuation of that thought. And Paul is saying, yes, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes on eternal things. We look towards rewards. We look towards all these powerful things that he's laid up for us. But also we fix our eyes on something else. We fix our eyes. He's saying, fix your eyes on me. And fix your eyes on others who are living like me. Right? Do you read it there? Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So he's saying, follow the example that I'm setting you. But that's not all he's saying. There's also a warning. Do you see the warning? Don't follow the example of some others. He's saying, I'm I'm telling you, even with tears, that there are others who are walking as enemies to the cross of Christ. And so immediately we see these two different things juxtaposed. There's there's men and women who are living in a way that they, they should be emulated and should be followed, and they can say, follow us as we follow Christ. And then there's others who Paul begins to warn them about and say, don't follow them. Please don't follow them. And we think it's just like a, a, a figure of speech when he says, and now I tell you, even with tears, he's crying as he writes this. I'm crying as I ask you, I beg you, I implore you, do not follow those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. He's saying all is not as it seems, please don't follow them. And by implication he's saying who they follow matters. It matters profoundly. Why does it matter so much? Well, look at the outcomes. We're going to get to this in more detail a little bit later, but look at verse 19. If we follow those who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, look at what our inheritance is. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame and their minds are set on earthly things. But look at the, look at the beautiful inheritance if we follow those who, like Paul, are setting an example of Christ to follow. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies. What a promise is that? To be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things 
to himself. And so this is the summary of what I want you to get briefly from what I'm trying to lay a platform for what I want to bring across to us this morning. Paul's saying, follow our example. Don't follow others' examples that are not following Christ's example. And what you choose will profoundly impact you. You with me? Very, very simple, right? So then we must ask, well, what example is it that Paul wants us to follow? And what example is it that he doesn't want us to follow, right? Who are these people with Paul that are setting a godly example? So I'm going to, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to answer that question. What is, um, this is the question I'm asking. What is the example you must follow? That's what you want to know, right? Chetan, when the tacky hits the tar, you want to know? Whose example are you going to follow? Are you going to follow someone? When the tacky hits the road, I want to know what example are you going to leave? Who can follow you? Can anybody follow us? Could anyone look at our marriage and say, I want a marriage like that? Could anyone look at our parenting and say, I want a parent like that? Could anyone look at our devotion and say, I want to have devotion like that? Could any of us look at each other's businesses and say, I want to be a businessman or a businesswoman like that person? It's not pie in the sky. This is a practical Christian outworking. So Paul's saying, in this context of this verse, I'm going to look at it and I'm going to unpack it just in the verses just around this verse 17. And then I think that Philippians is also saying a whole bunch about being an example. So we're going to look at it in those two, through those two lenses. So first let's look at the verses. I want to go back to verse 8 in chapter 3. Dev should have it for us. Thank you. Indeed, I count... Everything is a loss. We're asking the question, sorry I'm laboring this, but I just want us to all be clear. We're asking the question, Paul, what kind of example should I follow? And I believe that some of this is the answer. When Paul begins to speak and he says, the example that you follow is that I have counted all things as loss. I spoke about this the weekend before I went to Indonesia, that, that everything that he considered an advantage, all the many earthly things that Paul could have pointed to and said, this and this and this and this reason is why I can have salvation. He said, I've come to see it all as rubbish. Why? Why is he able to say that? He says, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. It doesn't mean that some of those things are not good. It doesn't mean that some of them are not noble, that we shouldn't do some of those things. It just means that in the light of seeing Jesus, in the light of seeing the worth of Christ, he says, all of that is as rubbish to me. I've realized it cannot achieve my salvation in any tiny, tiny way. Then he says, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. I hope already in our hearts as we've been doing this series in Philippians, when I read that text, something of recognition jumps up in your heart and you say, thank you, Jesus, that it's not the law that qualifies you. Aren't you grateful that it's not the, your ability to follow laws or moralistic behavior that qualifies you? I know some of you. I know me. We should all be unspeakably grateful at the example that Paul has when he says that we don't have to follow the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So he's saying the example that you follow is that my faith depends, my righteousness depends on my faith. Do you remember some weeks back I did an illustration up here and we had a piece of string and I had a piece of wire and I had a Bunsen burner, and I had all these different things. We looked at the phrases through the whole, the whole book of Philippians. We looked at every time that the little words, in Christ, appeared. Or in the Lord, or in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we found words like assurance. We found words like faith. We found words like, like uh, confidence. All of these different words. And they said, we have confidence in the Lord. We have faith in the Lord. We have, we have assurance in the Lord. And you can go and find them yourself in the book of Philippians. And I took those phrases, faith, love, hope, joy. And we hung them up on the string. And I got the Bunsen burner out. And I said, what happens when we have circumstances that come and press in on our lives? And we have the fire of circumstance, which some of you are going through right now with health. Craig, it's good to have you back in your neck brace. Praise God for your protection in that accident. Go and ask Craig for a testimony of God's grace over his life, and he'll tell you afterwards. Just look for the man with the neck brace. That's him. But what happens when that Bunsen burner comes and burns, and you've placed it on string? 
We burnt the string and it just snapped and everything fell down. And then we put it on the wire. Our faith is locked into righteousness in Jesus. That's where our righteousness is from. Nothing you can do, nothing I can do. Man, that's so freeing. If that's all you take from this whole long Philippians series, if that's all you take, that you can do nothing to earn your salvation, then we've won. And then Paul says, man, I just, if I, if I want to, in verse, in verse 10, I just want to know him. I just want to know him. I think this should be the cry of our hearts. Sometimes we want all the theology and all the lectures and all the what what I just want to know you, Jesus. It should be our cry in our bedroom. Just I want to know you. I want to know you so much, Jesus, that I want to know the power of your resurrection. And even if it costs me suffering, Paul says, I want it. Even if it takes me all the way to death like Jesus, I want it. I don't think I can say that yet, but man, I want to. This is the example I'm asking. What is the example that Paul's asking us to follow? And then he he kind of pauses in verse 12 and he realizes he's almost, he could come across as putting something unattainable in front of us. And thank God for these moments where he then says, not that I've already obtained all of this. Thank God he's not saying like he's perfect yet. Not that I've obtained all of this, yes, but but what I do is I press on. Because Jesus Christ has made me his own. If I, to, if I to contend for a second thing, which I'd want you to take out of this whole series, after salvation and faith alone, I would contend, I think, for this. Christ Jesus has made me his own. Jono alluded to it this morning. Our identity in Christ. Do you know how much this shapes us? Do you know how much what you believe, what God thinks about you, changes the way you live? It's profound. We, we worship this morning, and you know, there's like a tension that's created in worship. And you guys were, were outstanding, Ryan and team, this morning. And there's, there's a tension that's created. And we started off and we're singing uh, this song, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Though I go through the dark times, though I have this thing going on in my life, Jesus, I trust in you. And then we went on to the second song. And um, which was the second one again? You're a good, good father. And we're singing, you're so good. You're so good. You, you're perfect in all of your ways, was that phrase we were singing. And I was sitting with this tension, and I was saying, God, this, I know there's people here who, who can't sing that. They can't. Whatever, whatever you're facing, whatever it is you're going through, for some of you to sing, you're perfect in all of your ways. I trust you. That's a hard thing. It's easy when stuff's going well. Jesus, I trust in you. Who yeah. Get your charismatic on. But when you're in the depth of the valley of the shadow of death, and you're facing stuff that no one knows about, or stuff that, that could end your life, now he's, now he's singing, and, and the words are suddenly, wow, are you good? And I loved how he came back, and at the end, Victor so beautifully led us in that, that ocean song. You call me out upon the water, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you. And then the second verse goes on to speak about grace and how God rushes in. I keep my eyes above the waves. Yes, the waves are there. The waves are real. The circumstances are real. But God, I keep my eyes above the waves. Jesus has made me his own. So Paul's not running some race of achievement, of trying to prove to God. He's running his race because he knows that Jesus has taken hold of him. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, he continues. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. In Christ Jesus. I think the example of Paul here is he's, he says in other parts of Scripture, he was a murderer. He approved of, of murder. We had Stephen here uh, last weekend, all one and a half hours of him. Thank you for your grace. But it was so powerful. <laughs> it was so powerful as he shared his testimony. And he was, he was sharing how, I mean, I was looking at him and I was thinking, man, you, you're sharing that you've murdered people. It's, 
It's hectic. But I think some of us, the lesson for me and what Paul is saying in following his example is that some of us get so caught up in the past and the stuff that defines us and, and what's happened in our past and the sins we've committed, the sins we've committed against. And I just love that Paul just stops praying about his belly button. Do you know what I mean about that? Like sometimes in our, in our prayer, we're just like looking at ourselves the whole time. It's like you're praying, it's like you, you're obsessed with your belly button. That's the, that's the expression. So you're just like looking at yourself the whole time and you're just praying about your stuff and your need for a wife or your need for a husband or your issue. And, and those time for that and that's good and God needs to help us heal and help us grow but we also need times where we say forgetting what lies behind I press on towards the goal for which Christ has called me heavenward and we need to press forward even in our practice of devotional life you need to do an audit guys if we spend 95% of the time praying for ourselves there's a problem God doesn't want you to have a wife that much As soon as you stop praying so much, he might send you one. (laughs) Go to Jeff for tips. And excellently yesterday. But then Paul also realizes in verse 15 that not everyone's there yet. And he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. It's great, isn't it? Not I'll sit down and convince you and force you and make you follow New Gen's rules. No, God, God will, God's going to get you. The hound of heaven is coming for you. Sorry, I was much longer there than I, I wanted to be. With that, but it's just such a beautiful section of scripture. But what Paul's doing is that he's effectively, when he says, imitate me and imitate others who are following Christ, that doesn't say it in there, but that's the insinuation. He says it all over the Bible. Follow me as I follow Christ. He's looking back, and it's almost like this race that he's talking about. You know, the metaphor Bates was using was a very accurate one to the text. It's a race. But it's also like a pattern. He's saying there's like a, there's like a pattern that I want you to follow, and I want you to look at us, and I want you to see how we're doing it, and I want you to follow it. It's practical, right? That's what Paul's saying. And he's not longing for just a few of them to do it. He's longing for the whole congregation. He says, I know you're not all there yet with maturity. That's okay. But God's going to bring you there. Do you remember 1 verse 9? And he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He will bring it to completion. You might not feel mature today. You probably aren't. That's okay. He's going to bring it to completion. He's going to keep working in us and working in us. God knows how much I need it. He's longing for not just a few, but for the whole congregation to begin running this race. Can you, I just want you for a moment to imagine what it would look like, New Gen, just just of us in the room. What are we today? 150 people? Imagine if just we really got hold of this and said, God, we're going to follow the example of Paul in the way we run our business, in the way we run our home, in the way we look after one another, in the way we grieve, in the way we face illness, all of these things. God, there's a pattern you've provided, and imagine if we got hold of it and started to live like that. Now we're talking about lights on a hill, a city that can't be hidden. But then there's another pattern or another race that's being run at the same time. Verse 18, For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory and their shame with minds set on earthly things. And Paul again is going after the Judaizers. These poor guys. There's this group of people who are trying to make the Philippians run a race, and their race looks like this. Almost exactly the same as what Paul's asking them to do. But just this one little amendment, I want you to get circumcised. I want you to add something to your salvation. I want you to do something. Jesus plus something. And they, these Judaizers are, are trying to get the Philippians to, to follow a pattern. They're saying, follow us. This is how we've achieved our salvation. We've had it. You, come be like us. And Paul says, don't be deceived. The race looks the same, but it's completely different. Do you know why it's so different? Let me give you two quick definitions. 
religion, it's not from the Oxford Dictionary. Religion is when we try to run a race to achieve salvation. Just digest that for a moment. That's what the Judaizers are asking them to do. We want you to do something in order to achieve salvation. So religion says, I want you to follow this set of morals. I want you to follow this behavior. You, know, you all know it, right? You know the big ones. Don't get drunk. Don't sleep with your girlfriend. Don't sleep with your boyfriend. Wada, wada, wada. Wada, wada, wada. We know all these things, and they're good things. They're godly things. But when we begin to try and make those things earn, pay for our salvation, it's such a subtle shift, isn't it? Such a small shift because are Christians still meant to do those things? Absolutely. Such a tiny little shift. But religion runs a race to try and achieve salvation. But those who want to run in the example of Paul, they already assured of their salvation. They've received the free gift of salvation. So why are they running? Well, they're running because they're grateful. They're running because they're astounded that God would forgive a sinner like them. And they say, God, what can I give you? What can I give you? Do, do you remember, any of you watch Friends? Any hands? Who watches Friends? It's, it's fine. I also watch Friends. I've got my hand up. So you don't have to be like embarrassed. It's a great show. Um, do, do, have any of you watched the episode where Phoebe runs? Okay. And there's two different kind of races going on here. There's like, so Rachel runs like this. She's like the dignified runner. And then Phoebe asks to go running with her one day. And so Rachel says, sure, I'd love to run with you. But she doesn't know that Phoebe runs like this. <laughs> right? Have any, of you have, seen the, have any of you seen this episode? Is it just me making a fool of myself up here? And then there's a line at the end of that where Rachel's too embarrassed to run with her anymore. And then she pretends she's sick and what, what. And anyway, ends up they find each other in the park. And then Rachel says to her, I can't run with you. You're too embarrassing. And Phoebe says, what's the point of running if you don't have fun? If you don't enjoy it? She says, I run like a child because it brings me great joy. And there's something there of like a metaphor for what's going on here. You can run this, they're the same race. They look so similar. But the one of us, we're running like, oh, I've got to do it. I've got to do it. I've got to achieve. I've got to achieve. No, don't look at that. Don't look at that girl. No, no, no. And, and, we, and we, we're trying to achieve our salvation the whole time. And then there's another way we're running, just with joy. And we're just like, God, I can't believe that you've done this in my life. This is so amazing. How do I respond to you? I'm not trying to earn it. I've got it. I'm assured. I know he's given it to me. And I'm just saying, man, God, I want to respond. Which one, which one is more attractive? Maybe you don't know Jesus here this morning and you're looking in. Let me ask you, do you want some dry dog's bones religious laws to follow? Or do you want some joy? I know which one I'm going after. And that's the difference between religion. And, and I, I want to just be respectful for a moment. Because I think it's so easy just to dismiss the religious, the fools. Listen, these people are incredibly sincere. Incredibly sincere. People who are trying to reach God like this are erasing their hearts out. They are sacrificing a lot in their own lives. Even going into Indonesia and meeting these genuine Muslim men and women, they, they're doing their, they're trying their hardest to reach God. Some of them are, the one guy that we met had just spent his life savings getting to Mecca because that takes them to the next level of, they're doing everything they can. They're paying prices in order to get there. They're subduing their bodies and they're subduing their wills. But the tragedy is that only one race ends in victory. God's made it so clear through Scripture that it's only through Jesus Christ and faith in Him that we come to salvation. He's not going to take good intentions and say, you know what, you did it all wrong, but I'm so glad you had good intentions. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip this next section. When you read the book of Philippians, just say this briefly. When you look at the whole book, there's so much around the example that we should follow. 
And it all hinges on this one big thing in chapter 2. Do you remember it? The Messiah poem? And Jesus himself, who being God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but gave himself up. There's this incredible picture of the gospel in those four or five verses in chapter 2. And basically, where Paul is in this specific text, Paul is saying, follow me. Really, the whole book of Philippians is saying, follow Christ. Follow Christ. Follow the example of Christ who laid down everything. And you can go and get that and listen to that because it's deeply encouraging. But let me, let me close off by asking a few practical questions. What does this mean for us? So we've been talking about the Philippians. We've been talking about what Paul's trying to write to the Philippians. But what about you today? In your Stellenbosch life, in your situation that you're facing, well, what, is this, what does this mean? I want to just suggest a few things. They're not complicated, extremely simple. It suggests that you need to choose very carefully who you're going to model your life on. If you don't know who you're modeling your life on, don't assume that you're not modeling your life on someone you are. You just haven't thought about it. On TV, on some celebrity, some Twitter tweet, you're basing your life on something. So the kind of two immediate questions that spring out of this text for us is, well, who, who are you going to follow? Here's some options. Maybe you're going to just So we've all got family. We've all got fathers and mothers. Some of us have really healthy ones. Some of us have really unhealthy ones in terms of relationally. You can choose, regardless of what your background is, whether you're going to just let that kind of flow through your life into your friendships, kids, whatever else, or you can choose and say, no, God, by your power, we're going to start a new lineage here. By your power, that stuff that I see in my family, that's going to stop. I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to be the next divorce case in my family. I'm not going to be the next whatever it, it may be. Angry husband, angry man. I'd love to, I, mean, I could share so much stuff here vulnerably with you guys, just around the things that, that and my, I've got good parents, but God's had to cut stuff out of our lives. And you know what the scary thing is for me as I am a parent? It's that I realize the same thing is going to happen with my kids. They're going to have to go before God with hurts that they received at my hands. Trying my best, let me tell you, trying my best not to hurt them. Just like my mom and dad did with me. There was a day where I had such freedom, where I was in prayer, and this was a big issue for me. And I was like, why my dad not love me? And I was like, and I went before God, and I, it was like, with the greatest clarity, God showed me that my dad had done the best he knew how. The best he knew how. Do you know how liberating that was for me? I could just let my dad off the hook. I don't have to see him every time and be like, mm, in my heart, you know. I was just like, oh, this is amazing. He, did the, he, did, he had certain tools at his disposal. He was of a certain generation. His dad had, had done certain things to them as kids. You know, there's like a whole, it's, it's huge, guys. And when you have your own kids and you suddenly realize, my gosh, these kids are going to look at me and think, what was he doing? <laughs> it gives you a whole new perspective on how to look at your own parents. And I want to encourage us, what kind of example will you choose to follow? Read dead people. Read lots and lots of dead people. They've lived their lives. You know they finished strong. Don't go after the latest celebrity pastor. Go after the guys. You know that they finished strong. Hudson Taylor, Isabel Kuhn, Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot. These guys, they write powerful, powerful biographies. They leave examples for us to follow. I've just finished another one by Isabel Kuhn last week. Nests Above the Abyss. About their, their trip into Burma. And she's dedicated her entire life with her husband, John. It's the most beautiful reading. You just weep. As you read it, what are you going to give yourself to? Biographies of people or endless nights of TV? It's going to profoundly impact your life. Maybe not now. Maybe we won't see the results for the next five years, the next 10 years. But by the time you're 60 years old, depending on what you've given your life to, we'll see. 
And then the second immediate question is, well, what kind of example will you choose to leave? I remember someone said, don't make people lie at your funeral. <laughs> that, <laughs> that expression. <laughs> the poor pastor who's got to stand up and there's some terrible oak, you know, who died. And now you've got to find something good to say. He, was, uh, he wore nice suits. <laughs> you know, don't let that be your example. But guys, my, my point in this is, it's not going to happen by accident. You're going to follow certain people because you've made a conscious decision to do so. The effects in your own lives and in the lives of your children are going to profoundly change because of that. And the example that you leave and the legacy that you leave is not going to be one that you dream about leaving. It's going to be one that you are currently living. Nearly there. Are you guys still with me? Do I need to end there? I don't want to keep you here and not even listening to me. I'm just talking to myself. Give me five more minutes. All right. It's, not, it's only seven minutes to live, and we're actually doing well. Come on. The second thing I want to quickly say, so the first one was that choose carefully who you're going to model your life on and what legacy you're going to leave. The second one is this, teaching alone doesn't cut it. That's a huge lesson for us, modern church, that want to just push, compartmentalize our God bit into the one and a half hours or two hours, and lo and behold, those guys go for two and a half hours like last week. Flip, we're you leaving that church. We're going somewhere else because they burnt my roast. You know, <laughs> but we we model church around like the rest of our lives. Our time is precious. Don't give me like three hours. Don't ask me for stuff during the week. Just give it all to me. One and a half hours on a Sunday. Come on, hit me. But if we don't have living examples, if we don't actually engage and start to really talk about what true community looks like. And what it costs, and what it means for your home, and what it means for your fridge, and what it means for a whole bunch of different practical areas of our lives. See, part of the tragedy of, of community light church, if I can call it that, churches where we're trying to do community like as a little side thing bolted on, is that it elevates a teaching style. Now, everything becomes about the pastor and how good he is at preaching on a Sunday morning. You know what? There's some mornings I'm going to suck. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I appreciate that encouragement. <laughs> but it's true, right? You've been here, people. You've been here. If that's what it's based on, right? So the problem with community light is that it elevates teaching to a status that God never intended it to have. And it removes Living examples. Man, I need to see how you do your work. I need to see, if I've come out of a broken home, I need to see what a marriage looks like that actually works. You know, the craziest thing for me is where people look for advice. I was talking with, a, with an unsaved friend of mine. He's um, going through a hectic time separation and so I was asking him, because he's reaching out to me a little bit, and I was asking him about his wife and saying, who is she reaching out to? And he said, oh, other friend, and this is the story. And I sat there, and I thought, Jesus, help, this, help them. Because, and I'm, I'm serious, I'm not being silly, I'm being dead serious. Help them, because the woman she's reaching out to has gone through stuff and worse than what she's gone through, and it's not repaired. It's completely broken. And so what in the world is she going to help her with? We've got to look for examples of, of godliness, of, of looking at, I want, to, I want to find people who, look, who parented their children and their children have grown up to love Jesus. I'm like, okay, come here, come here. Tell me what you did. I'm not looking for the guy who's got three kids on the streets taking drugs and saying, hey, come and give me parenting tips. Surely that makes sense. Right? Community lights. I mean, think about Jesus. Think about Jesus. He didn't come and set up a classroom and tell his disciples, you know, there's miracles happening all over the world, guys. And here's a photo. 
Jesus didn't do that. He, he doesn't tell them about the kingdom of heaven. He goes out and he shows them the kingdom of heaven. He says, the kingdom of heaven has come. Look, look, here's a person with a demon possession. I don't know why I'm pointing at you, Seb, but let's just go with it. <laughs> here's, here's a person with demon possession. The demon comes out. Why does the demon come out? Because the kingdom of heaven has come. Why does the lame person walk? We think it's all about the lame person. Oh, Jesus loves the lame person, and they're walking. Yes, Jesus does love the lame person. Of course he does. But that wasn't the point of the parable. The point of the story and Jesus healing that person was because he was saying the kingdom of heaven has come. And he didn't do it in a classroom. We need living examples. Guys, and then I want to to, to challenge you. Because if we're going to live like that, man, it starts to get so inconvenient. Do you know what it means? It means, Chris, I know you've got hardly any time on your hands. It means you need to take some time and you need to find some guys to love and care for. Does that sound like fun in your current schedule? (laughs) Help him, Jesus. It means that some of us with homes need to open our homes that are our private space that are like, you don't understand, I recharge here. (laughs) I don't want some 20-year-old coming in here with their opinions and want to talk for four hours. Like, I'm over that. We've got to open our homes. It means some of us need to go and take our budgets and say, hey, you know all this money we put aside here for clothes and all the other luxuries? We're going to take some of that and we're going to put it in our grocery budget. And we're going to have guys in our home that are going to come and eat here so they can see what our marriage looks like. So when the tacky hits the tar, it's a lot more difficult. Some of us are on the other side and we're saying, here am I, pick me, pick me. You guys, your student guys, you need to press in. We're not going to come chasing after you. I've got five kids for goodness sake. Do you know how hard it is trying to keep them just alive? (laughs) I don't know I don't have time to think, I wonder who I can phone today and invite. But when Bernie phones me, where's Bernie? Bernie's brilliant at this. He phones and says, hey, can I, come and, can I come and just hang out? Of course you can. Come home. Can we watch football? Yes. A little secret is oftentimes I actually prefer watching football alone. Sorry to all of you who I invite to football regularly. They really are. There's days I just think, oh, I just want to watch. But you know what? There's a, there's a greater purpose for football. It's greater than just <laughs> whether Liverpool win. There is. But guys, this is the practical of where examples begin to actually live out. And it's not going to change unless each and every single one of us begin to say, Father, here am I. I, Daniel and Kendra, I don't know if you guys are here this morning, shared a beautiful story that in her home, the parents every single Sunday night had a movie and popcorn evening. Her mom just made mounds and mounds of popcorn. They got a nice wholesome Christian movie, hopefully. And anyone was invited any Sunday night. And it was just an open invite. And guys would just come into their home. I'm telling you, if you went and found those people who watched silly movies at their house, I guarantee you'll find stories of God working in their lives. I saw something in their marriage. I saw something. I was just blown away that they opened their home up. Man, and I'm speaking to myself here. We need to get so much better at this. Clear some of the clutter out of our diaries. Shall we pray and end it there? Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. I want to thank you for the gaps that I've left this morning that your Holy Spirit can come and so fill them and so stir our hearts to action. Lord, we want to be people who respond in obedience to you. Not hearers of the word only, but hearers of the word who then go out and do it. Lord, even in our lives this morning, come and challenge us as to how we can live more meaningfully as examples to one another but how we can leave an example for others to follow because those ahead of us have, followed, have given us an example, have taken time out of their diaries that we would take time. Those who have supported us, God, would we support as well? Father, I want to pray for insecurities in the room today. Those who don't feel that they can ask for anyone's time or that they're not worth anyone investing in. Lord, would you come and smash those things in your name? Lord, I want to pray for any condemnation of people who feel like I've tried to run over their private home space or push them into something they're not ready for. God, that's not my intent. My intent is that I just provoke a little bit and let ears be open to hear your word. Lord, you speak to them. You challenge us on what we need to do, God. 
that it would be sustainable and have lasting fruit. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen.